uh, thank you for the introduction. Also, thank you for having me here uh, the entire week. Um, so yeah, this is a joint work with uh, Yele Don, Chris Mayens, and uh, Chris Schaffner. So the main result, I can sort of summarize in one sentence, what we show is that if the Sigma protocol is secure, then the Bison is secure, then it's the Ashomia transformation is secure as well in the quantum random oracle model. So now I sort of assume that well, part of you guys are not that familiar with uh, this terminology, so I'm going to take some time to introduce these things and explain the result, uh, discuss, discuss the result in, in more detail. Um, so we start with uh, with the sigma protocols. So by the way, if something is unclear, I mean, feel free to interrupt. I'll be happy to explain in more detail. I'd rather go a bit slower, take some time in the beginning. Maybe I have to skip something at the end since I'm losing uh, many of you earlier. So a, a sigma protocol is a, well, formally speaking, uh, an interactive proof of a of a special form to prove that the instance X is, is in, a, in a language L, meaning that there exists a witness satisfying some relation without revealing this witness. So typical examples are proving that a number is a quadratic residue modulo a composite integer, proving that three group elements form a so-called BDH triple, or proving that uh, two graphs are isomorphic without revealing the permutation that maps one to the other. This looks a bit abstract, so if you see this for the first time, I think it's best to give you a concrete example of such a sigma protocol, to which you can then hold on to in the remainder of the talk when I speak about general sigma protocols. And sort of the example that I want to show you, so is a very uh, 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 well-known, classical, very neat result. So that's for, for graph isomorphism. So the situation is the following right, two graphs sort of lying in front of you of, uh, on the table, so to speak. And sort of one party, the prover, he knows that these two graphs are isomorphic. So you know, there's a permutation that maps one onto the other and he even knows what this permutation is that maps one onto the other. And then he wants to convince the verifier uh, uh, of the fact that, that, that these two graphs are isomorphic, but he wants to do it in such a way without revealing the permutation to the verifier. This permutation may be valuable information to the prover, which he does not to, to, to just give away for, for free, but still he wants to convince the verifier that the two graphs are isomorphic. Now this can be done by means of an interactive protocol, which I'm gonna show you uh, now, I mean, it's very simple, but very neat, very elegant, I think. So it works as follows. So in the first step, the prover chooses a random permutation and applies it to the graph G0. So it produces a new graph H, which again is going to be isomorphic to the two. So this graph H he sends to the verifier. And then the verifier, he chooses a random so-called challenge bit C and sends that back to the, ver uh, to the prover. And then the prover replies with the permutation tau that maps either G0 to H or G1 to H, depending what this challenge bit C is. And well, the verifier checks if this permutation does what it's supposed to do. And accepts sort of the proof if it does and rejects the proof if, if it does not. Um, now it's easy to see that indeed if the two graphs are isomorphic and the prover knows the permutation, then he can always sort of compute this permutation and the check here will, will work out. So the verifier will always accept. Um, now, but what about security? What if the two graphs are not isomorphic? What can we sort of conclude then? Um, well, it's easy to see that if the two graphs are not isomorphic, then no matter what the prover does, and recall he's supposed to apply a random permutation to G0, but if he's dishonest, he wants to fool the verifier, he may do whatever he wants. But no matter how he computes this graph H that he sends in the first move, if G0 and G1 are not isomorphic, then H is going to be not isomorphic to at least one of the two. 
have to apply transitivity if it was isomorphic to both, and the two must be isomorphic. But then with probability one half, he, the prover has to provide the permutation mapping H to the graph to which it is not isomorphic, which of course is not possible. So with probability one half, he will, will, will not be able to provide the permutation that he is asked to, to provide. And so with probability one half, the verifier will, will reject the proof. <coughs> On the other hand, this also means that with probability one half, the verifier will accept so that the prover managed to fool the verifier, so to speak. But of course, this can improve just by repeating the protocol several times. And this can actually be done in parallel to ensure that the verifier accepts uh, uh, only with negligible probability. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this security property is referred to as soundness, that, that you cannot convince a verifier of a false statement, so to speak. Now, for this example, and also for many other typical examples of, of interactive proofs, one can actually show a stronger notion of security referred to as, as a proof of knowledge, which means that if the verifier accepts the proof, he's not only convinced that the statement is true, that the two graphs are isomorphic, but he's actually convinced that the prover knows a witness, that the prover knows an, a, a permutation in the case of, of, of this example. Now, first glance, not fully clear how he would actually formalize this, that the prover knows certain piece of information. I may uh, say a few words about this towards the end of the talk, but it's also not that relevant for the purpose of the talk. More important is there are different notions of security that we can consider with respect to a, a dishonest prover. Um, yes? Yes, it's going to be the next bullet here, right? So the, the, the whole point of this interactive proof is that we want that the verifier does not learn that the witness, does not, does not learn the permutation. And I mean, here in this example, you sort of see that the verifier doesn't get to learn, doesn't obtain, say, the permutation in plane, uh, but sort of, of course, what we want is to have a formal reasoning that in some well-defined way, he indeed does not learn any information about uh, um, the permutation. And this is sort of what is then referred to as zero knowledge, which as a matter of fact is even a stronger property. It, it shows, again, in a very well-defined sense that the verifier does not learn inf any information at all and particularly does not learn any information about the permutation or in this example or about the witness in general. And again, this is what is referred to as the zero knowledge property, which in a way protects the prover from the verifier who might be curious and wants to learn the witness. No, that's sort of, well, <coughs> no. Well, let's say typical six, uh, uh, sigma protocols have this property. I mean, the question is whether you, uh, whether you require in the definition of a sigma protocol uh, 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 that it has this property. But let's say so the interesting, the typical sigma protocols, the ones we care about, we want that it satisfies this, this zero knowledge property as well. Um, <clears throat> so in, in the remainder of this talk, I'm not really, I'm not going to be concerned about this zero knowledge property. I'm only concerned about the security against the dishonest provers of soundness or proof of knowledge. But it's sort of understood that we're, in the end, of course, we're interested or we are applying our results to sigma protocols that have this additional zero knowledge property, that have this security property to protect the information of the, of the prover. Mm -hmm. saying like it doesn't you don't make it any easier for the verified to calculate the difference itself like you have the isomorphic information. Yes, that's sort of pretty much how we would de define zero knowledge that whatever sort of information that the verifier can obtain 
by interacting with the prover by running this protocol, the verifier could produce also just by doing local computation without interacting with the prover. That's sort of pretty much the definition of zero knowledge, of that of, of not learning any information sort of beyond what he can anyway learn or compute on his own by doing local computation. I mean, of course, right, if he has infinite computing power, then of course he can compute a permutation that maps one graph to the other, right? Uh, uh, <coughs> so what, what this, um, so zero knowledge, um, <coughs> um, of course zero knowledge doesn't sort of prevent this, this sort of attack. I mean, it's, it's in line, right, with, with whatever he can compute by interacting with the prover he can compute on, on his own. Now, if the verifier is computationally unbounded, then it's sort of trivially satisfied by this protocol, right? Because the verifier can compute sort of the permutation on his own, so by interacting with the prover, it's not gonna help. But sort of more interesting is in the case where we sort of assume that on his own, the verifier cannot compute the permutation between the two graphs, and then sort of the zero knowledge property ensures that also by interacting with the prover, he cannot do any better. He also will not be able to achieve it. Okay. But sort of again, I mean this sort of, a, I mean it's an important security property, of course that's why we care about the interactive proofs, but it's sort of not the security property that, that uh, is, is concerned in, in this talk. Okay, and so by the way, what makes an interactive proof a sigma protocol is this three move structure with the second message being a, a randomly chosen uh, a so called challenge. And by the way, sort of from now on, I will always assume that the challenge is chosen from a, from a large uh, a space, so that the challenge is a random bit string, say to ensure negligible soundness error. And again, this can always be achieved just by repeating the protocol in parallel several times. Okay, um, yes, so that's, that's sort of introduction to sigma protocols. Next thing is the fiat Chamier transformation. So the fiat Chamier transformation is a way to turn such an interactive proof now into a non-interactive proof. Now the reason why such a sigma protocol is an interactive proof is because it's the verifier that chooses the challenge here. And if you think about it, it's sort of crucial that it's the verifier who chooses this random challenge. If you'd allow the prover to choose the challenge at the random, well, then it's sort of easy to see that he can easily fool the verifier. <coughs> now, the idea of the fiat Chamier transformation is to, well, still let the prover choose the challenge not the verifier, but in a way to, to tie his hands very tightly in how he has to choose this challenge. So he's not allowed to choose it as he wants or, or, or at random, but we ask that he chooses it or computes it by applying a given function, by applying a given hash function h to the first message a here. Oh, sorry, I was going fast. So applying this hash function h to the first message uh, uh, A here. Now for some technical reason, I'll maybe say a few words about that uh, towards the end, uh, it should actually compute the challenge as a hash of the instance X together with A, but for simplicity I'm gonna ignore that uh, in, in the talk. And then of course also the verifier when he does sort of his final check on whether he should accept or reject the proof is gonna use H of A as the challenge in his sort of verification check. <coughs> and now we see we have sort of two messages going from the prover to the verifier, and of course those can be sent in one go, in one move, obtaining now a, a non-interactive proof. And now sort of the hope is, and, and it 
this is in a way really sort of a hope that if we plug in, if we use a good cryptographic hash function that in a way behaves like a random function, <coughs> that, that this fiat Chomia transformation inherits the security properties from the interactive sigma protocol. Now, this is something that cannot really be rigorously proven in a satisfactory way, but it works very well in practice. Um, yes, yeah, so on a side remark, if we understand sort of the instance X, like the two graphs, as a public key, and the witness, like the permutation between the two graphs, as a secret key, and we additionally put in some message here when we compute the challenge or when the prover computes the challenge, then we can understand sort of the proof here as a signature on the message M in the sense that you can only produce this signature if you know the secret key, but everyone else who knows the public key can verify it. That's exactly what we want from a signature scheme. <coughs> yes? I don't even know about that. Maybe it was a, yeah. Okay. Yes. Really. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, sort of a very strong, uh, uh, or rather strong, no uh, uh, assumption. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, really? Okay, okay. So I'm not aware of this uh, most recent uh, update on this. So okay. Okay, okay, thanks for pointing this out. <coughs> um, <coughs> okay, so, but of course, because we still want to have some rigorous reasoning, uh, um, <coughs> the, the random oracle model was what's introduced. And on a very high level, the idea of the random oracle model is to replace this hash function by some idealized object and then do some rigorous security proof uh, 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 in this sort of idealized model. And more concretely, the idea is that is, is to not let H be a fixed hash function that is known to the parties, but to let it be a uniformly random function that is unknown to the parties. And the only way the parties can sort of evaluate the function uh, uh, is by making a query to some oracle, which we refer to then as the random oracle. Right? If a party wants to know what's the hash of a value A, has to pose a query to this oracle, and then the oracle will tell him what, what H of A is for randomly chosen H. That's exactly the next slide. <laughs> Indeed, so at first glance, it looks like now from the prover's perspective, there's no difference between the interactive sigma protocol and sort of the non-interactive fiat Chomia transformation in the random oracle model, where sort of this random oracle model then forces the prover again somehow to, to interact with the random oracles. At first glance, there seems to be no difference. At first glance, there seems to be nothing to prove. Uh, well, in a way, that's true for the honest prover, but if we look at the dishonest prover, then the dishonest prover in the random oracle model, he can actually query the random oracle many, many times. Right? This sort of captures that in the real life, where the prover knows the hash function, of course, he can locally evaluate the hash function as often as he wants. <coughs> of course, this gives him some advantage, sort of clearly, it's sort of would expect that it increases its success probability in fooling the verifier linearly in the number of queries that he makes. Uh, uh, but whether this is really the case, I mean, needs to be verified. 
And indeed, I mean, this is the case, so it's of a classical result. And well, I mean, classical can be understood as non-quantum, but also in the sense it's sort of an old, well-known result uh, in, in, in this area that if the sigma protocol is secure, then its Piotromia transformation is secure as well in the random orphan model. And you can sort of plug in your favorite security notion and I mean, it, it holds for that uh, security notion. So it can be soundness or proof of knowledge and both can actually come in different flavors depending on whether we limit the computational power of the prover or not. And then sort of the random oracle heuristic then suggests that you get security in real life when you plug in a good enough hash function. But again, um, well, I wrote here that, that this cannot be proven. Apparently it can be proven uh, uh, <laughs> based on some uh, LWE assumption. But certainly that's something that works very well in practice. And I also want to point out, I mean, this random oracle methodology is not only used in the context of interactive proofs and Piachomia transformation, but sort of throughout, throughout the crypto. Of course, it's still right that the, that the Carlos version is not secure, right? It's never been proved that when you do the Carlos transformation, you get an infinite number of answers that you can never get any wrong. Yeah, yeah. So but but sort of you're saying in, in this particular in this context of the Fiat Shamia transformation. Sure, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's so much about Oh no, of course, no. And it's going to be important uh, for, for later to, to give you sort of an idea of the proof of this classical result. <coughs> so I want to prove for the proof that shows that, that if the Sigma protocol is secure, then its Piotr transformation is secure as well. So the proof is sort of a typical proof by reduction. That's, that's well, almost any proof in, in crypto. So it cons Right, so we start with a hypothetical prover P that attacks the fiat Shamia transformation in the random oracle model and we transform it into a prover P prime attacking the sigma protocol and succeeding in, in attacking the sigma protocol with a similar probability as P. This then sort of implies that if the sigma protocol is secure, meaning there cannot be such a prover P prime, then we know that there cannot be such a prover P attacking the, the fiat Shamia transformation uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, a success. With a success. <coughs> okay, so here we have our assumed prover that interacts with the random oracle and at the end outputs a, a valid proof for incorrect statement with some well, good and non negligible probability. And again, we want to transform this now into a prover P prime that, sort of, that, that plays the role of a prover in a sigma protocol. So it sends the first message, receives a channel, ch challenge, and then sends a reply. And we want sort of that this then is also a convincing proof, a convincing sort of interactive proof for this false statement. Okay, so the idea is, or what we want in a way, is, is to have this A prime here equal to the A that the prover outputs and the Z prime here to the Z that the prover outputs because, well, we know by sort of assumption this is a good proof here, but sort of the issue is that, that, that here we have H of A and this proof is going to be checked with respect to Z prime. So in a way what we, what, want or need to ensure is that this H of A equals this C prime here, in a high level. So how can this then be achieved in the following way? So we choose a random index I, so I mean, so that's sort of what, what, what P prime does. So P prime locally runs, runs P, sort of in his head if you want, uh, runs P. Additionally, it chooses a random index I of pointing to or selecting one of the queries that P makes to the random oracle. Then the AI 
that is sort of part of this query, I mean, the AI for which P wants to know the hash in this query is then output as the first message A prime in the sigma protocol that, that the prover P is meant to attack. <coughs> okay, and then from that point on, all the queries that P makes are answered with what we call a reprogrammed hash function H prime, which coincides with the original H, except at the point A, we set it to be equal to C prime. So the C prime that we obtain here as a count. And then at the end, we just sort of output the C uh, uh, that P outputs as the reply in the sigma protocol. Okay. So now what we have to ensure, essentially are a couple of things, we have to ensure that the AI here equals the A that P outputs at the end, and also that sort of this, this reprogramming of the hash function doesn't change the success probability or the probability of this output here being a valid proof. Now the latter holds uh, this year holds essentially because both H and H prime are just random functions. If you take a random function, take one function evaluation, by an, replace it by another random value, well, you just get yet another random function, so that has no impact here. And as for this here, well, here sort of the observation is that in order to be able to produce a valid proof here, P needs to know the hash of A. And I mean, the only way the prover can learn the hash of A is by querying the oracle on the point A. So this means one of these queries, A1 up to AQ, must be this A here. Otherwise, he has no chance in producing a valid proof here. So and then with because we choose sort of one query at random, the probability that we're going to hit the one where he asks for A is uh, 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 1 over Q. So if you put things together, sort of see that, well, I mean, going to succeed here with probability, uh, just uh, probability the same, but up to a loss uh, linear in Q, which was to be expected, as I sort of said already on the previous slide. Hmm? Okay. Right, sort of the point here, right, if A, A uh, equals AI and AI is equal prime, so the, here the A equals A prime, and the H prime of A was set to the challenge, so I mean this sort of ensures that indeed this is going to be verified uh, uh, correctly by the verifier. <coughs> okay, good, yes, yes. Okay, so now I want to move on to the quantum random oracle model, finally something quantum. Um, so the motivation for this quantum version is that if the dishonest prover has, has a quantum computer uh, uh, available, then in, in real life when he knows what the hash function is, when he can locally compute the hash function, with a quantum computer he can compute this hash function then in superposition. Right? He can then apply sort of the hash function to a superposition of different inputs sort of at the same time. Right, so if this means that then in the random oracle model to be minimally realistic, we also have to give the prover there the ability to query the random oracle in superposition. So compared to before, where sort of the prover had the ability to query the random oracle many, many times, now he, in addition, he can query it in quantum superposition. Right, he can give the, the random the random oracle, a superposition of all possible inputs and getting the corresponding superposition of input-output pairs back as reply from the random oracle. <coughs> now, I mean, you can actually also control sort of the, the, the output register, but I'm sort of neglecting this here to keep the global expression a bit simpler. Okay. And of course, then the big question is whether this security of the fiat geometry transformation uh, uh, still stands. Can we give the prover this additional power in interacting with the random oracle? 
And well, the first I want to show you that sort of the answer is not fully obvious. That if we sort of try to recycle the classical reasoning, we're going to get stuck pretty soon. And so the, the, the issue occurs with, with I mean, so the, the, the classical reduction works by well, choosing this, this one of the queries at random and just outputting whatever p queries here as the first message in the sigma protocol. But now the problem is that this query may be quantum, whereas this message here that we're supposed to send to the verifier in the sigma protocol still has to be classical. So I cannot just forward this, 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 this here uh, as we do in, in the previous case. <clears throat> now, of course, sort of a natural, I mean, the first idea that comes to mind to transform a quantum message, a superposition, quantum superposition of messages into a classical message is to perform a measurement, right? So, so to measure this state here to obtain the message that we're going to send to the verifier as the first message in the, in the Sigma protocol. But then, of course, the problem is, as I'm sure you all know, that such a measurement disturbs the state, disturbs sort of the internal state of the prover, and then we don't really know how the prover then behaves with this disturbed internal state. I mean, it might be that the prover actually detects that his query got measured and then just abort, not output a valid proof, and then I'm sort of stuck because then I don't know how to, where to get my Z prime here from. So, well, what, what is known about this uh, problem, so what was shown mainly by Dominic Unruh, uh, or, well, on the one hand side, he sort of showed there exists another transformation uh, uh, which, which remains secure, but this transformation is, is less efficient than the fiat Jamia transformation. He also showed uh, uh, that if the sigma protocol is statistically sound, then the fiat Jamia transformation is, well, at least still computationally sound. So in a way, security or soundness is preserved, but there is this degradation from, from statistical to, to computational, meaning that here we only have security if you assume that the prover is computationally sounded. In particular, there's sort of no statement. We don't know if any positive, we did know about any positive results for the proof of knowledge, kind of this stronger notion of security that, that, that we may also consider. As a matter of fact, there have actually been some negative claims in the literature about, about the fiat Jomia transformation not being a proof of knowledge and that this degradation in sort of quality of soundness is, is inherent, but these claims have actually not so convincing reasoning and indeed sort of our result shows that these negative claims well, are, are not true. That's our coming back to more or less what I had on the first slide, our result says that if pretty much like the classical version, if the sigma protocol is secure, then the fiat Jomia transformation is secure as well, but now in the quantum random oracle model. So when we give the prover this additional power to, to query the random oracle in quantum superposition. Again, here we can plug in, you can plug in your favorite notion of security, and it is preserved. So a small caveat or a small difference to the classical version of the theorem is that our reduction is slightly less tight. Instead of a loss, a linear in Q, we get a loss quadratic in Q. Whether this is inherent or not, uh, we don't know. We don't really know what to believe here. I also have to point out that in, in uh, independent work, we just got aware of this a couple of weeks ago, uh, Lee and Sandri showed very much the same result, but sort of their security loss is substantially worse. So it's worth a few put So yeah, let, let me first give some intuition for why kind of the, the, the result of the role uh, may carry over to the quantum setting. So I'm going to start with kind of, sort of the natural approach already pointed out before, where we pretty much do the same as in the classical case, except that we do perform, or we don't get around it, that we do perform this measurement of the query in order to obtain a classical message that we can uh, uh, send as first message uh, in the Sigma protocol to the verifier. Uh, and then, sort of like in the classical part, from that point on, we, we answer all queries with the reprogrammed uh, hash function H prime. 
course, as I already pointed out before, sort of the issue with this is that the prover P here may detect that his query got measured and then they just abort, not output a valid proof down here and then sort of we're stuck not knowing where to get the C prime from. Um, however, if one actually looks more detailed in how uh, um, a prover can actually check whether his query gets measured or not, uh, you, you notice or you can see that if he performs this check to detect whether his query got measured or not, well, he figure out whether his query got measured or not, but then he's not going to learn any information on the hash function through this query. So he can check whether his, his uh, query got measured or not, but if he decides to do so, he's not going to learn any information on the hash function through that query. And of course, at the end, he actually has to know, have some information on the hash function. In the end, for this to be a valid proof, he needs to know the hash of A. So intuitively, there must be one query where he does not check whether he gets measured or not. There must be one query where he learns this information, what H of A is. And so the intuition tells us if we then pick this right query, uh, well, things might still work out. <laughs> well, I mean, sort of, if, if I write down how I would actually, how I would um, um, uh, detect, try to detect such such a uh, a measurement, then well. <clears throat> What I would do essentially, I would put sort of a query in superposition of all possible states and then, and then slightly oversimplified, perform a measurement in the Hadamard basis. But then, of course, right, this sort of the, the way sort of the queries are answered are in sort of the computational basis, which means if you measure in the Hadamard basis, you will lose all the information. But again, I mean, that's sort of intuition. I mean, that's maybe one particular way to check. Maybe there would be other particular ways. Of, I mean, the whole thing is continuous. He might do something in between to learn some information, whether he got measured, but still some information on H. So, I mean, this is it's just intuition. So, of course, the big question is whether this intuition can be turned into a rigorous proof. And actually, the answer is no. Well, at least we don't know how to do it. <coughs> But what we can turn into a rigorous proof is a slight tweak to, 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 to what we're doing here. And somewhat interestingly, this tweak is, well, at least to me, counterintuitive. I don't understand why it helps. Actually, it seems to me that it only makes things work, but in a way, uh, worse, but in a way it helps, well, to do the math. And the tweak is simply that, right, I mean, we still choose a random query measure that query, but then um, we either from this very point on, we use the reprogrammed hash function or from the next query on. And this choice we do with probability 50-50. So either already with this query, we use the reprogrammed hash function or we still use the original H. <coughs> So with this query, we either use sort of the reprogrammed hash function, which means we're going to reply here with C prime, or we're going to use the original H. And again, this choice we do with probability 50-50. But then from the next on, certainly we're going to use the reprogrammed hash function. And again, I have no clue, no intuition why it should be useful to use the original, not the reprogrammed hash function here. But again, sort of it helps to do the math. Um, yes, so on a side note, um, I want to point out that, right, I mean, H is a uniformly random function. Um, whereas this P prime that we construct, we want it to be efficient. But of course, just writing down a uniformly random function, let alone evaluating a uniformly random function on a superposition of input, is of course not feasible. So the way to overcome this is by not using a uniformly random function, but using a two QY independent hash function. 
and sort of unknown results, we know that is sort of indistinguishable for P, so this is not going to change anything in the future. <coughs> but that's sort of, yeah, orthogonal sort of to, to the actual issue that, that yeah, we can discuss here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of the, how, how the reduction works. And now I actually want to walk you through the proof and, and show that this indeed uh, works. So it's going to get a bit more technical now. Um, but still, I mean, the proof overall is, is, let's say, simple enough that I can actually present it here. And I hope that you can, to some uh, extent, follow the proof. <clears throat> okay, so first some uh, preliminary observations and, and definitions or, or notations. Um, so we're using a standard argument, we can assume without loss of generality that the prover uh, only makes measurements at the end. So some standard purification argument that sort of goes on until sort of the point when he actually produces A and C, it just performs unitary operations on a single measure. We also can assume without loss of generality that in addition to A and Z, the prover also outputs the hash of A. Uh, he can do that simply, simply, I mean, he can learn this simply by doing one more query to the oracle, so we assume that he actually does that. Of course, it just increases the query complexity by one, but I mean, that doesn't really matter. Okay. And then, in terms of notation, uh, I let phi zero to be the initial state of the prover. I'm going to write u from j to i to be the unitary that describes the evolution of P's internal state plus the query registers from query J to query I. And you see, I mean, when I say from query J, it's sort of in between. So at the point where the prover has sent the query, but not yet received the reply from, from, from the oracle. <clears throat> and well, sort of applying u from 0 to i to the initial state and gives us sort of the state at the query i. And well, similarly, we get the state at the end, so before p then applies the measurement control. Okay. And then, now this is going to look a bit uglier. Uh, don't get around this. So for an arbitrary but fixed choice of the first message, which I call a prime here, we're going to look at this projection. Now this projection corresponds to a measurement, a quantum measurement, namely to the following measurement, uh, it, which is applied to the final state here. It measures A, H, and Z, as, as, as P does, but in addition, it does sort of the following checks. It checks if A equals this, this fixed choice A prime, it checks whether H is indeed what it's supposed to be, namely the hash of K, and it checks whether the proof is valid whether sort of the, 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 the verifier would accept uh, this proof. <coughs> okay. And well, to simplify notation, I'm going to write pi of i to q as well the concatenation of u from i to q followed by this measurement. So, so this you can just think of is what happens from query i on till the end uh, uh, of, of the execution of P, including these additional checks here. <clears throat> yes, yes. So that's just sort of when, when we run P sort of in, in the ordinary mode, uh, interacting with, the, with the, the given random oracle. Yes. <clears throat> and well, sort of using this notation, we then see that the square norm of, of this vector here, which just corresponds to ordinary execution of P uh, with, with the ordinary oracle H, then is, well, I mean, just corresponds to the probability that the proof output by P is valid, plus this additional check that we want A to be equal to A prime. So of course, sort of what we know is that well, at least when we sum this over all A prime, well, by assumption that this probability is not too small, is not negligible. And sort of the other term, which is sort of the term we're then actually interested in, 
it's this piece here, which well, looks a little bit more ugly, but I hope that I convince you that it very much corresponds to the way that P prime works, right? Namely, here we start with an execution of P up to some step I, up to some theory I, that means again the average over the choice of I. Then we perform a measurement here. We perform a measurement and we check with, I mean, a measurement on the query register. We check whether the query equals, again, that fixed value A prime. And then we do one more step, or not, depending on the choice of P, which is random, with the original H, and then we do the rest with the reprogrammed hash function H prime. Right, so with this well, expected square, square norm here, corresponds then to the success probability of the P prime that we constructed, of the prover that is attacking the sigma protocol. <clears throat> right, and of course what we want to show is that, that this, this here is not too small and also this probability should not be too small. That's, that's the goal. Okay, so let's do that then. Okay, so I'm going to start with this uh, vector here, sort of corresponding to an execution of P up to query I, and then without doing a measurement, we continue, but now with the reprogrammed hash function H prime. <coughs> Using basic uh, mathematics, I mean, this can be decomposed into those two parts, just observing that A plus the identity minus A is again the identity of this here. And then I'm going to well, decompose this part here, right, which sort of describes well, what P does using H prime from step I well, to, to the end into, well, what P does from step I to I plus 1 and then from I plus 1 to Q. Okay. Now, so the first crucial observation is that this projection here, uh, I minus A, is a projection into the orthogonal complement of A prime. So applied to well, any vector, this is going to be a superposition of possible A's excluding A prime, right? And then what this unitary here does, right, it applies the hash function, the reprogrammed hash function H to this superposition. But the only point where H and H prime differ is the point A prime, which does not appear in this superposition here. So this means I can replace H prime by H here. Okay, good. Then I just sort of uh, uh, work this, this, work out this term here, observing that uh, U from I to I plus one applied to phi I just sort of the state at the next query, phi i plus 1, and, and this is, is, well, just this here works out. So nothing uh, really happening here. Okay, so, so far so good. Mm. <clears throat> now, next important observation is that these two terms, so the left and the right of the, of the equality sign, are exactly the same, except on the right-hand side, the index i is incremented by one. So this means if I add up this inequality for all choices of i, uh, many of these terms are going to cancel out each other. So concretely, if I sum up over all i's, I mean, the only copy of this term that survives on the left-hand side is when i equals zero. Because if i equals one, going to be cancelled out with this term here for i equals zero and so on and so forth. So this one is the only term that survives on, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side the only copy of this term that survives is the one where i is, is, is q minus one giving this one here. <coughs> and well sort of these other two terms, well I just add them up over all choices of i. Okay. Now, I understand it's sort of not clear where this is going or where we are, but I do want to point out, right, sort of that these two terms here that, that, that sort of appear now very much corresponds to what P prime does, right? Here we have a term that corresponds to measuring 
query i and then continuing with the reprogram oracle, whereas this term here corresponds to measuring the i's query, doing one more step with the original h, and then sort of continuing, continuing with the reprogram that I promised. So it seem to be at least on the right track. Um, next thing, we'll just sort of rewrite this in a bit uh, more compact form. Well, it's easy to see. I mean, for b equals zero, uh, I mean, this thing here equals that term, and if b equals one, this term corresponds to that one. So just a straightforward rewriting without anything actually happening. Okay, next step is to, so we rearrange the terms a bit, we take norm and we apply triangle inequality, which then gives us uh, this thing here, right? I mean, this term equals that one, so I mean, the minus sign can, can, minus sign can go because we take the norm. This one equals that term and this one equals that term. Again, nothing really spectacular happening here. Okay, we're, we're getting there, so we'll be there soon. Just, uh, uh, hang on to it. Um, now I'm gonna look at this term here. So the phi q here, the phi q here is the state obtained by p when interacting with the original hash function h. <clears throat> Whereas this projection here, uh, it measures a and h, and it checks whether h is the hash of a. But now the hash with respect to the reprogram hash function which forces this hash value to be c prime. <clears throat> but sort of this state here was produced only interacting with h, so the state is statistically independent of c prime. So the probability that sort of a, a measurement of that state equals c prime, which is chosen uniformly at random, this probability is going to be negligibly small. And I mean, this probability is, of course, related to the norm here. It's, 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 it's the square of this norm, so this means you can actually ignore this term here or the norm of this term here. Okay, and now we're almost there. Uh, I'm going to divide both sides by 2q, which is going to transform this sum here into an expectation, and I square both sides and I apply Jensen's inequality on the left-hand side to get the square inside the expectation. And now we see that, well, this term is already what we want it to be. That's sort of the left-hand side up here, which again corresponds to the success probability of our prover P prime. And the right-hand side, well, it's almost what we want it to be. Uh, it's the success probability of P when interacting with the reprogrammed oracle from the start. Uh, but of course, I've already said that again, I mean, the reprogrammed oracle or the original oracle, I mean, these are just two random functions sort of indistinguishable from each other. So that's actually the same as, well, on the right-hand side, what we want. <coughs> so this, uh, uh, well, yeah, finishes the proof. <coughs> yes. Yes, uh, sure, yeah, so yeah, it's not fully correct. So when I write here, it's a success probability of P prime, always means plus uh, including that we want A to be uh, A prime. So these are the probabilities of the proofs being valid. Exactly, so in the end, yes, of course, I have to sum uh, both sides over all A primes mm -hmm. to get sort of a, a statement that doesn't include this uh, yeah, uh, choice of A prime anymore. Yes, sure. Okay, um, yes, a couple of remarks I want to say. So, uh, uh, till now, sort of at least implicitly, I assume that the instance for which the dishonest prover wants to forge a proof is, 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 is fixed, but can easily be extended to so-called adaptive prover that on his own can choose the instance for which he wants to forge the proof. So that's why it's actually important that the challenge is computed as a hash of the instance and the first message. That sort of then does the job or deals with such an ad adaptive uh, dishonest proof. Mm. Also, I mean, sort of this, this kind of 
construction or the analysis sort of works rather generically uh, uh, beyond sort of classical sigma protocols. For instance, the, the construction would also work if this output Z, if the response Z was actually a quantum state. So in a way, it's sort of a, a generic result that allows to, in a way, <coughs> in a way allows to, to, to reprogram a random oracle at, 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 uh, at, uh, at, at one point. Okay, yes, yeah, so the implications uh, for, for signatures are, are then as follows. If you have a language that is hard on average, meaning that for random instance it's hard, it's computationally hard to find a, a witness, and we have a sigma protocol that satisfies the following uh, requirement, you want it to be a proof of knowledge, so the stronger notion of security against a, a, a quantum prover, and I want it to be honest verifies your knowledge and has to satisfy a couple of, of other but sort of natural assumptions, then it then sort of follows from our result that the corresponding fiat Jamir signature scheme is secure, the standard notion of security for digital signature scheme in the quantum random oracle model. <clears throat> okay, um, I see that I'm almost out of time. Uh, do you have some flexibility or do you want um, me to stop? So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I'll add just a few more slides, but I think I can go quickly over. So, for sort of one issue here is that this sort of assumption of a sigma protocol to be a proof of knowledge against a quantum dishonest prover is, 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 is sort of not a very mild assumption. It turns out to be rather tricky to, 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 to satisfy or to show that a certain pro or that a typical protocol satisfy this notion. Again, so the issue being that we want it to be secure against a quantum dishonest prover. <clears throat> right, sort of our, our result shows that if this is satisfied for the sigma protocol, then the fiat Chamiya transformation satisfies this. Also, what the question is whether the sigma protocol already satisfies this notion of security against the quantum dishonest prover. So I want to say a few words about that. Um, <clears throat> already said, sort of, how would you actually capture that the party knows something? So this is done by means of a knowledge extractor that 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 where it's sort of required that if you have a prover that succeeds in convincing the verifier, then this knowledge extractor by interacting with the prover is able to extract, to compute a witness. And how this is usually done classically is by just running the prover uh, 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 and then sort of rewinding the prover to the point where he sent the first message and run it again with a different challenge. And then for typical schemes, uh, it is so that if you now have two answers for two different challenges, then you can compute the witness. But this is problematic in the quantum case uh, uh, where sort of the reply may be obtained by a quantum measurement, which of course is not reversible. Um, <clears throat> okay, now Dominic Unruh showed um, <clears throat> that in some cases, uh, uh, when the protocol has so-called unique responses, then one can get this, this, this proof of knowledge against a quantum dishonest prover. But the caveat with this is that is this unique responses property is often not satisfied, at least sort of for the languages that we care about in the context of security against uh, a quantum, uh, quantum attack. On the other hand, you also showed that sort of the obvious computational version of this property is not good enough, which is a pity because typical protocols seem to satisfy this computational version. So what we show is that we can strengthen this computational version uh, in the spirit of, of this collapsing property, which probably many of you are not aware, uh, uh, but that's not uh, such a, a big deal. A caveat is that, well, it's sort of so that the strengthened version of this uh, computational property is still hard to prove. Uh, 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 <coughs> and, and, and we still require so-called special soundness, which I also didn't explain too much in detail. Um, yeah, 
which I think I don't want to go too much more. So uh, I'll, I'll say it uh, again on, on this slide. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so sort of summarizing and, and comparing also with uh, the, the work of uh, uh, Lee and Sandri, which I actually put it online a couple of weeks ago. So we both show um, a particular extract and reprogram a technique in the quantum random oracle model, which applied to the Piaget-Jungian transformation then sort of immediately gives security in the quantum random oracle model. Again, we sort of our reduction loses the factor of Q squared. Lee and Sandri they lose the factor of Q to the nine. Um, so this then implies that if the sigma protocol is a quantum proof of noise, a proof of noise against quantum dishonest provers, and satisfies some additionally typically satisfied properties then the resulting sig uh, uh, Piaget signature scheme is secure. Now also we both showed uh, that if we consider a new and somewhat stronger notion of what is referred to as computational unique responses together with a special soundness then implies that the signal protocol is a quantum proof of knowledge and therefore then combining with this that the resulting Piaget signature scheme is a signal a secure signature scheme, and now sort of coming to the lithium. In our paper, we sort of conjecture, whereas Lee and Sandy, they managed to prove that, that the sigma protocol underlying the lithium satisfy this new notion of computational unique responses. So all these things sort of apply and uh, uh, implies that the lithium, so that's sort of one of the candidates for the NIST competition for post-quantum signature schemes, in case some of you don't know, that the lithium is secure in the quantum random oracle model. <coughs> um, yeah, so in, in the paper we also claimed uh, 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 the fish or picnic, one of these two versions, to be uh, uh, that these things apply as well. And, and that it's secure in the quantum random oracle model, but we actually missed that, that the underlying sigma protocol there is not special sound. So uh, yeah, that's sort of a claim we actually have to make that now. So I thought I'd put it on the slide to prove that. Okay, um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. A couple of open problems. It's sort of this, this quadratic loss that we have. Where I don't know, yeah, I don't really know whether this is inherent or, or might be able to improve it to a linear loss that we have in the classic case. And sort of this new, uh, version of computational unique responses, which I didn't really explain much in detail. Uh, <coughs> again, this is something that seems to be hard so far to prove. So uh, I think we need sort of more tools in order to, to deal with that. And yeah, I mentioned sort of special soundness, which I also didn't explain too much in detail, still being sort of a hurdle in, in some cases. Yeah. Thank you. If I have a reference, or not, not. Well, I mean, um, I, I'm not, not on the spot, but I'll be able to give you a reference if you want. Uh, or yeah, yeah. I mean, or I mean, we do ref reference it in our paper. So I mean, I would go there and, and okay. look to that. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Otherwise, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah. <coughs>